Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Why is it that Christians find themselves drifting away from God? Why is it that we find ourselves allowing our relationship with God to grow cold? What's happening in our lives that, um, that we end up finding ourselves in that place? Why do some Christians lose traction and cease to mature in their faith? Why is it that some Christians let their relationships with uh, their brothers and sisters in Christ grow stale? They drift away from the pathway of righteousness. What's going on in a person's life that uh, leads them to do these things? This morning, we're going to look into the Word of God. We're going to dive in and seek to understand why it is that we have a tendency to wander, a tendency to drift, a tendency to leave the God we love. If you would, please stand. We're going to go over to the book of Ruth, where we'll read there in chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1 through 7. Scripture says, Now it came about in the days when the judges governed, that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there, then Elimelech, the Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other Ruth, and they lived there about ten years. Then both Malone and Chilion also died, and the woman was brought bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters and laws that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. You may be seated. From the scriptures, we hear about a man and a woman by the name of Elimelech and Naomi who decided that it was in their best interest to leave their home, leave their family, their friends, their neighbors, their relatives, and sojourn to the land of Moab. There was a famine taking place in the land, and they thought it was in their best interest to leave and to go and find refuge, a safe haven elsewhere. We find that this didn't turn out so well for the family. It was evident in the scriptures that God's heavy hand was upon them. Why did they drift away? Aside from there being a famine in the land, why did they drift away? Why did they leave their homeland? It was very specific in the scriptures. God had made it very clear to his people that they were to stay together as a family, that there was strength in numbers. That God's people were to work together and to bless each other even in the difficult and challenging times of life. But yet here we find this particular family leaving and going to Moab. Why did they do this? I believe there's some insight in the scriptures here as to why they did that. Why do we do this today? I believe one of the reasons why that we leave the God we love, why we drift why we sojourn is because of our love for the things of this world. The appetite of the stomach, the pleasures of the eyes. We are people that are distracted by shiny objects. Second Timothy 4.10 Paul Speaking there to, to Timothy says, For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Possessions, careers, hobbies, interests. There are many things in this world that distract us from our God. That lead us astray. That cause us to wander away from the God 
that we love. In 1 Timothy 6.10, it says this, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. If you're a part of the study, you would agree that Elimelech and Naomi pierced themselves with many griefs. They were concerned about their welfare. They were concerned about food. They were concerned about living at a certain standard. They were used to a certain lifestyle. And now that lifestyle was being interrupted by a famine. And they didn't like that. They couldn't stand to think about not having the luxuries that they were used to. And so they decided that it was in their best interest to leave. But we find here in the scriptures that it wasn't in their best interest to leave the God they loved. Their God was there in Jerusalem with his people. And when they left their family, when they left their homeland and drifted to a pagan place, a place where they worshiped pagan gods, they separated themselves from the God that they loved. We find that in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22, this is not in, in your notes, where a rich man approaches Jesus. And he says, Jesus, I'll follow you. I've lived a good life. I'll follow you. And Jesus said, leave your riches behind and then come follow me. And it says in the scriptures that that rich man walked away sad because he had great wealth. He was not willing to give it up for the sake of Christ. He was not willing to do with less so that he could have more with Christ. God sometimes challenges his people, challenges his family to do with less in order to have more of him. God recognizes that our wealth, our possessions are a distraction for us. You think of how much time and energy you put into your career, your jobs, and then you have your home and your cars and your other material possessions, and, and then there are the retreats, the the getaways, the vacations, and all the other things you enjoy doing. Think about how much time that takes up from actually spending quality time and serving God. It can become a distraction, so much so that God oftentimes allows a famine to enter in in order to teach us how to do with less of this and more of Him. God was teaching His people to trust Him, even in the dark times. We would all agree that it's easy to trust God when things are going our way, when things are good, when we're getting what we want and what we need. It's great. It's kosher. Everything is beautiful. But when tragedy strikes, when hardship comes, our faith is shaken. We begin to question our belief. Begin to wonder, well, God, are you really there? Maybe you're not there. Maybe I ought to take my life into my own hands. And maybe I ought to go and do something in my own power and in my own strength to provide for my family. Sometimes God just wants you to trust Him and Him alone for your livelihood. And stop depending upon your ability, your strength, your power, your might, your resources, your connections. We can get so wrapped up in the world that we forget about our relationship with God, about how much God wants to be the provider, the protector, the one to see and, and meet our every need and even satisfy the desires of our hearts. We forget about that. We put our trust in our strength and in our abilities, and in our relationships to get ourselves through the dark times. Sometimes, the only way that you can get through the dark times is by trusting in God alone. God will oftentimes put us in a, a particular situation to where there is nobody 
that's going to be able to help us. Nobody that's going to be able to deliver us. No human being. No earthly powers. No earthly entities. No one. Not mother, father, sister, brother, neighbor will be able to deliver us. I believe that God puts us right there so that we will reach out to Him and Him alone. To learn that He is our protector, our provider. Everything that we need to live this life to the fullest. Who are you trusting in today? Who are you running to to rescue you? Are you running away from God? Are you putting your trust in your own strength in your own intelligence, wisdom, smarts to get you out of the situation you're in? Or are you dropping to your knees and crying out to God for deliverance? Elimelech and Naomi should have dropped to their knees and cried out to their God. They should have stayed with the family. Instead of focusing so much on self, they should have looked around and said, how can I help my neighbor? How can I help my relatives? How can I help my community get through this famine? No, they ran. They abandoned the people that they said that they loved. They abandoned their community. They abandoned the fellowship of the body of Christ. They took off for better land. We drift away from God we abandon our relationship with God because we love the things of this world more than we love Him. How, do you, how would you, many of you today know people who have stopped going to church, reading the Bible, praying to go pursue a career? How many people do you know that have given up walking with Christ because they met a particular special person in their life. Now they've abandoned church, they've abandoned fellowship, they've abandoned serving God because they're now in a relationship. They walk away from the God they say they love. I know people like this. I know people who have left their, their relationship with God to pursue a career. They've left their God. They've wandered and drifted from Him to embrace a relationship with a human being. The love of this world and the things in it have caused many to wander, to go astray. That's one of the reasons. Another reason why we drift, we wander, is because we become dissatisfied with God's plan for our lives. We become dissatisfied with God's plan for our lives. We don't like it. We simply would prefer that His plan would be in more in line with our plan for our lives. There's God's plan, and then there's our plan. There's God's way, and then there's our way. There's what God knows is best for us, and then there's what we believe is best for us. Numbers 14, 3 through 4. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. The Israelites were not happy with God's plan of deliverance. He called his people out of Egypt. And he said, follow me. And it just so happened that pathway lied through the desert, through the sea, through dry and desolate land. They weren't happy about that plan. They didn't like that plan. That didn't sit well with them. So they looked back and said, do you remember how wonderful it was in Egypt? You see, they had forgotten that they were in slavery. You see, the things of the world were more important than the slavery that they were subjected to. They forgot that they were, they were bound. They were enslaved. They had taskmasters. They were subject to a pagan king. They forgot about that. All they could think about was food. 
and drink and the homes that they were living in. They were looking at all of that and then they were saying, we're out here in the desert, living in tents, wanderers, drifters. They forgot that they were being guided and led by God himself. The presence of God was with them, but that wasn't enough. They were not happy with God's plan. God's plan is good and it's perfect whether you like it or not. There is no better way to live this life. If you want to live life to the fullest, if you want to experience this life as God intended for you to, then there is no sweeter spot than to be in the will of God for your life. In other words, living His plan, living His way, following Him, watching and looking for that guiding light of His to lead you through the darkness. There's no better way. But we might say to ourselves, well, I'm not happy with the challenges in my life. I'm not happy with the person I'm married to. I'm not happy with the job I have. I'm not happy with where I'm living. I'm not happy with my neighbors. I'm not happy. I don't like it. And I want out. I don't like the school I'm going to. I don't like the car I'm driving. Lord, if you were such a good God, I'd have a better home. I'd have a better car. I'd have a prettier uh, wife. I'd have a more handsome husband. Prettier husband. <laughs> I'd be more successful. I'd have everything I want and not a care in the world if you were such a good God. You see, we have made up our own God. Many of us have. This is how God should be. He should be like this. He should act like that. You see, we forget that God tells us who He is. He shows us his heart here in the Bible. This is God right here. And if what you think of him, if what you believe in, believe of him isn't in here, then it's not of him. You've made it up. God does allow his children to go through difficulties and challenges and hardships. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he does love you. And he wants you to turn and trust in him. Sometimes the only way for God to get you up and close and personal with him is to allow you to go through difficult and challenging times. You see, when things are going great for us, we drift from God oftentimes. We forget about him. We forget to thank him for the blessings. And, and we drift. Think about it, kids. Kids are, I mean, they tell you so much about us as adults. Give a kid a popsicle and watch what he does with that popsicle. Do you think that he's going to stand right there next to you and eat that popsicle and give you some as well? Absolutely not. Every kid that I've ever handed a popsicle took off, meaning they wanted that popsicle for themselves. Some of them didn't even say thanks. Once they got it in their hand, they put it in their mouth, and they took off. Does they didn't want to share it. Mine, mine, wait a minute, I, I bought that, I gave that to you. My dad used to do that to me. He'd give me a popsicle, and then he'd ask me for a bite. Oh, and I would just, whoa. Because he would, he would take such big bites, and, and I didn't like that. And he'd take half the popsicle. You see, I forgot that he was the one who purchased the popsicle, and he's the one who gave me the popsicle. I forgot about that. And so it was his right to take some of that popsicle. Our God is a good God, and he's a loving God, and he's a compassionate God. But sometimes he has to bring us to our knees because we won't go there on our own. And that's what God did with Naomi and Emelech and the rest of the family. But what are the consequences? Are there any consequences from drifting away from God? Are there any consequences? There certainly are. Here's what the consequences are when we drift away from God. It puts us at odds with God. It puts us at odds with Him. James 4.4. 4. Listen to what 
God is saying through James to the people. He says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? He says, when you leave the God you love and you go back into that world, God views that as hostility towards him. He's like, where are you going? I thought I was your first love. Why are you abandoning me for the pleasures of the world? What's happened to you? What's wrong with you? What's going on? Why have you walked away from me? You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Here's James talking to the, the new church, the Christian church. He says, be careful that you don't embrace the world. And forget about your God. Deuteronomy 6.15 For the Lord your God, who is among you, is a jealous God. Our God is jealous. He's jealous for your love. He's jealous for your attention. He's jealous for your embrace. He's jealous for your affection. He loves you and he wants to be loved by you, but he won't force you to love him. And that's why even in hard times and difficult and challenging times when God allows those things to come upon us that many people don't turn to him. Even in those dark times, they refuse to embrace their God, to love him. The cares of this world, the draw, the vacuum of this life pulls us away from God. It happened to Adam and Eve. It's happening to us today. Many Christians today are being drawn away from their God. It puts us at odds with God. But it also makes us vulnerable to attack. Makes us vulnerable to attack. 1 Peter 5.8 Your enemy the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. There are there's strength in numbers. We know this. We learn this from the animal kingdom. When the herd stays together, it's impenetrable. But when one drifts away from the herd, it becomes vulnerable. And when a Christian drifts away from prayer, when they drift away from fellowship, when they drift away from service, when they drift away from worship, they become vulnerable. When they disconnect themselves to the source of life, Jesus Christ, from the model from heaven, they become vulnerable. And Satan takes them down. And that's what he did to Naomi and her family. Satan took them down. It wasn't God's fault. They made a choice. Drifting away from God here, this is a choice. You make it. God doesn't want you to choose that pathway. We choose it for ourselves. Because again, because we love the things of this world and because we come, become dissatisfied with the way God is managing our lives. We want to be in control. We want to manage. We want to be the one to dictate the pace, to make the plan, to draw up the blueprints. We want to be the architectures of our lives as if somehow we could do a better job than God. When are we ever going to get it? God is all-knowing. He's omnipotent. He sees the future. He knows what's coming our way, and He can prepare us now for whatever it is if we would only stay with Him. God had something wonderful on the way for His family. He was preparing deliverance. And we see in the Scripture how God did bring deliverance to the people there, to the family of God that remained and did not drift away and go to Moab or some other country. It makes us vulnerable to attack. We become weak. We become frail. We don't have brothers and sisters in Christ surrounding us and encouraging us, lifting us up in prayer, supporting us, providing for us, edifying us. We miss out on all that. But there's also another thing. When we come out of the light, we walk in to the darkness. We begin to walk in darkness. John 8, 12 says this, I am the light of the world. 
He who follows me will not walk in the darkness. If you're not following Jesus, you're walking in darkness. It's as simple as that. Not because I said it, but because God said it. The reason why I have so many passages here is because I want you to know this is what God has to say. Not what Pastor Ron has to say. I'm sharing the truth with you. It's up to you to accept it or reject it. God says, if you follow Him, you will walk in the light. And those who walk in the light do not stumble. They prosper, they flourish, they're blessed. Yes, there are challenges along that way as well. But we have the light, the guiding light, to help us either go around that barricade or over it or under it, however God would choose. Because we'll see it. God will show it to us. His light will shine upon it. Psalm 143, 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you, for to you, I lift up my soul. The psalmist says that it is God and Him alone that we should be looking to for guidance and direction, for support and for help. And that when we are walking with Him, we're walking in the light as Jesus Himself is in the light. John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Listen, if you're not following Jesus, you're walking in darkness. If you're not listening to the voice of Jesus, you're walking in darkness. There are many voices out there, many, many voices. Unfortunately, some Christians are listening to those voices. There's only one voice we as Christians should be listening to, and that's God's voice. If you're a child of God here today, if you want to keep from wandering from the Lord, drifting away from Him, if you want to come home, is there anyone watching live on TV? Is there anyone here that wants to come home? Here's what you can expect to receive if you come home. If you've been wandering, if you've been drifting, if you sojourn to another land, left the God you loved, here's what you can expect if you come home. You're gonna, you can expect this, forgiveness, forgiveness. Jeremiah 31, 34. For I will forgive their wickedness, says the Lord, and will remember their sins no more. It doesn't matter how long you've drifted away from God. It doesn't matter how long you've lived in a foreign land, living and caring for the things of the world. It doesn't matter if you've abandoned your relationship with God for a pagan relationship with a, another person. What matters is that you come home. God is calling all sinners to come home. And if you come home, there will be forgiveness waiting for you. Acts 22, 16. Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. Ananias said to Paul, Get up, Paul, and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on His name. You know that when we've been drifting, when we've wandered from God, when we come back to Him and we cry out to Him, there's forgiveness. Forgiveness for whatever you did while you were away from God. Forgiveness. Do you need forgiveness today? Do you need to come back home? Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Him. Call upon that name, that name that is above every name, that name upon which we must be saved. The name of Jesus. You see, forgiveness doesn't change the past. It changes your future. When we've been wandering and drifting and we come back to God and we ask for forgiveness, He sets our feet on the pathway of righteousness. He gets us back on track. Our future is now in order as God willed it, as God planned it. It doesn't nullify the sin that we've committed. No, that sin occurred. But what it does, it washes away that sin. Do you want to come home and receive forgiveness and have your sins washed away? Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Him. 
We'll find forgiveness, but we're also going to find compassion. Compassion. Everyone needs compassion. We know that. Everyone needs compassion. Isaiah 49, 13. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Everyone who drifts away from God will be afflicted. You will suffer. There will be pain and there will be hardship. But God says that he will show you compassion and that he will have compassion on those who have been afflicted. He will comfort you. You see, compassion is love feeling. Compassion is love feeling. But not only will there be forgiveness and compassion, but there will also be restoration. Restoration. In Joel 2.25, God says, I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. Those who have drifted away from God have lost much. I think about the prodigal son. I think about Naomi and the limelight here. How much they lost because they drifted away from God. What it cost them to walk away from Him. If you've ever drifted away from God and have come back to Him, then you know what it costs you. It's going to cost you something. God wants you to come back to Him. And He says this, is that don't concern yourself with everything you lost. Just come back to me. And I'll restore you. I'll wash you. I'll make you clean. I'll bless you all over again. We'll, we'll get moving forward together. All is not lost. But we've got to come back to Him. We've got to come back to God. I don't know where you're at today. Those of you watching on TV, where are you at? Have you drifted away from God? Have the cares of this world pulled you away from the one you love? If they have, then come back to Jesus. Cry out to Him. Repent of your sins and ask Him to forgive you. And he will restore you. You will find forgiveness. You will find compassion. You will find comfort with God. Let's bow our heads.